So, hello everyone. I'm going to discuss about Boethius and his work of the Constellation of Philosophy. So, who is Boethius? Anicius Manlius Severinus Boethius was the son of a Roman high government official. His interest in the writings of Plato and Aristotle made him introduce the Middle Ages of Greek philosophy by his Latin translations of the work of Aristotle. He was an orator, poet, musician, and philosopher, and he also served the next 12 years in the government, and he also wrote commentaries on Porphyry and Cicero, and began his works on Plato and Aristotle. He was indeed noble, wealthy, accomplished, and universally esteemed for his virtues high in the favor of the Gothic king, and he appeared to all men as a signal example of the union of merit and good fortune. Now, on his lifetime, starting from when he was on his twenties, Boethius became consul and first minister to the king Theodoric, and he was ultimately raised by Theodoric to the dignity of magister, officium or head of the whole civil administration. And by the 522 AD, he was made important of the masters, master of the offices of Italy. And also his two sons were exalted in honor and were created joint consuls. But a year later, on 524 AD, he was accused of treason imprisoned and executed dun, dun, dun. now during his imprisonment is a, where he birthed the book of Consolacion de la Filosofia Boethius wrote this book as a solitary prisoner in the city of Pavia upon reading the book the three main characters are Boethius as himself and Lady Philosophy and lastly Fortune. Now to describe the feel of the introduction of the Constellation of Philosophy, I would like you to see this painting, this Baroque painting by Pedro de Orente, entitled Boviccio and Philosophy. And I would also like to add importance to the poem of the book translated by H.R. James of Oxford. And it describes Boethius as Stripped of honors, wealth, and friends, with death hanging over him, and a terror worse than death, and the fear lest those dearest to him should be involved in the worst results of his downfall. He represents himself as seated in his prison, distraught with grief, indignant of the injustice of his misfortunes, and seeking relief for this melancholy in writing verses descriptive of his condition. Suddenly, there appears to him the divine figure of philosophy in the guise of a woman of superhuman dignity and beauty, who by a succession of discourses convinces him of the vanity of regret for the lost gifts of fortune, raises his mind once more to the contemplation of the true good, and makes clear to him the mystery of the world's moral government. Now, this discussion will focus on three books of the Consolation of Philosophy, which are the book one, The Sorrow of Boethius, the second book, The Vanity of Fortune's Gift, and the fifth book, which is um, on in Baird, which is free will and God's foreknowledge. Now, we proceed to the first book, which is The Sorrows of Boethius. 
So to put it on my own words, as I read it, as I imagined Boethius, at the introduction, he was basically crying when Lady Philosophy come forth to his blurry vision. And of course he was saddened because before he was respected and high of honors and suddenly now he's in jail. So he's basically in doubt of how things came to be and how could things go wrong with one like him who has been just all this time. So yeah, he's utterly in doubt to say the least and quite lost with answers. So, and Lady Philosophy is quite determined to help Boethius in this dark times of his. So Lady Philosophy starts the discourse with asking Boethius of what he's feeling and basically for him to open up to her so she can help him. So Boethius starts listing to just things he has done and a couple of those are how he said how often have I risked my position and influence to protect poor wretches from the false charges innumerable with which they were forever being harassed by the greed and license of the barbarians when ruin was taking over the fortunes of the provincials through the combined pressure of private rapine and public taxation, I grieved no less than the sufferers. So, as you can see, basically the mood of Boethius is somehow he's quite mad. And that he feels that his state is really an unjust state for a just man like him. Further on, just heaven, have I deserved this by my way of life? Did it make them fit accusers that my condemnation was foregone conclusion? Has fortune no shame? if not at the accusation of the innocent, at least for the vileness of my accusers. Perhaps thou wonderest what is the sum of the charges laid against me. And my love for justice had left me no hope of security at court. So here we see Poetheus is feeling like he's betrayed by the workplace has been on which is like the government I have never boasted of my good deeds in the spirit of self praise for whenever a man by proclaiming his good deeds received the recompense of fame he diminishes in a measure the secret regard the reward of a good conscience so here he speaks of good deeds should be kept by himself in private because it is much better that only you and God knows the good deed and it, it is much more fulfilling and it is and rewarding further this only will I say that the most crushing of misfortune's burden is that as soon as a charge is fastened upon the unhappy they are believed to have deserved these sufferings. I, for my part, who have been banished from all life's blessing, stripped of my honors, stained in repute, and punished for well-doing. So indeed, he believes that he is in a very unjust state and he, that he doesn't deserve being put to jail. And further into discussion, um, Lady Philosophy came to a conclusion. 
she came to a conclusion of Boethius' sickness on two parts, which is first, that he had forgotten the means that governed the world. And the second is that he had forgotten himself. Now, if you have remembered the introduction of Socrates and the Apology, where he had almost said the same thing, almost the same thing, where he had told the people of Athens that his accusers almost made him forget himself. While for in, in Boethius' con state, um, he had totally forgotten himself, which is a sad part as a fellow philosopher. Now, this, with this introduction of Boethius, this chart is where fi Lady Philosophy tries to fix Boethius' sickness. And she, the first thing that the discourse is about is the vanity of fortune's gift. Our riches, I pray thee, precious either to thy nature or in their own. What are they but mere gold and heaps of money? Yet these fine things show their quality better in the spending than in the hoarding. For I suppose tis plain that greed Alvas makes men hateful, while liberality brings fame. <laughs> So, basically, um, the book to further explains that if all the money in the world were heaped up in one man's possession, all others would be made poor. And it further explains that how unnecessary riches is because it cannot be possessed by only one person like in a simpler terms riches is parang like agawan like you can never win because it is an unbroken whole now here i read how poor and cramped a thing then is riches which more than one cannot possess as an unbroken whole which falls not to any one man's lot without the impoverishment of everyone else so for lady philosophy um riches is a vile thing to possess because it means that if you have too many of it it means that you're basically still stealing from those who have none so that makes you think basically of being charitable and not being a hoarder of riches now this a second concept on the book two of vanity of fortune is ownership now we look at the sky and the ocean and basically nature and lady philosophy asks us does the beauty of the fields delight you surely yes it is a beautiful part of a right beautiful whole Fitly indeed do we at times enjoy the serene calm of the sea, admire the sky, the stars, the moon, and the sun. Yet, it is any of this thy concern? Do thou venture to boast thyself of the beauty of any one of them? Art thou decked with spring's flowers? Is it thy fertility that swelleth the fruits of the autumn?
So basically, it the sex this conversation goes on, but basically, fortune is telling us that we basically don't own anything of nature and like in nature how can you boast of something that is not of your making that it is like god who made it and we don't own anything in this world basically because god owns everything Doubtless, the fruits of the earth are given for the substance of living creatures. But if thou art content to the supply thy wants so far as suffices nature, there is no need to resort to fortune's bounty. Nature is content with few things, and with the very little of these. So, this um, excerpt actually makes me think of global warming because of we can actually sustain ourselves through natural resources but we still want to have to dig on the ground and to actually rely on fossil fuels even though there's alternatives to it and and it actually makes me think of like how we're um garo tiga abuso ta ang nature and which daily philosophy tells us that nature is not ours and how can we boast of it it is not ours it is not our making we don't make the flower grow it is the sun, it is the water, it is the soil. It is never us. So, you know, it makes you think that how can we do this to things that is not even ours? And referring to Earth, of course. Now, third concept. Moving on to the third concept of the book two is possessions. Um, basically, Lady Philosophy asks people, or mainly Boethius, of what seek ye by all this noisy outcry for fortune to chase away poverty? I ween by means of abundance. And So, his will was that mankind should excel all things on earth. You trust down your worth beneath the lowest of things. Like, it's saying that God um, relies on us to be, to excel on things on earth. But, um, our focus is on possession and this riches. It is the lowest of things. In man, it shows a defect. How extravagant, then, is the error of yours in thinking that anything can be embellished by adornments, not its own. It cannot be. For if such accessories add any luster, it is the accessories that get the praise, while that which they veil and cover remains in the pristine ugliness. So, that, like, basically what an accessory does, you know, like, if you're wearing this necklace, what is actually admired is the necklace and not you. So, like, what good is it to wear a necklace and basically um, Lady Philosophy um, describes possession as covering what is ugly and which is kind of true for those who buy a lot of things 
Maybe because there's something so empty inside of them that they cannot buy into. So they buy it through external things. Anything that makes them happy. A car, a boat, a plane. But sometimes those people are doing it because they cannot afford to feel the emptiness inside of them. Now, further on. Um, Lady Philosophy also says that um, those people who has most actually want most. Like, this um, really bad attitude of um, humans to want more, more, and more. Um, my main example, my modern example is in the context of Lady Philosophy saying, this varied array of precious furniture needs more accessories for its protection. So yeah, if you buy a thing, you need to buy another thing to keep it sa- to keep it safe. And my modern example of this is, and you buy a cell phone. When you buy a cell phone, you think that it needs a cover, so you buy a cover. And you also think that oh, what if it falls? So I need a screen protector. So you buy a screen protector. But also inside oh my gosh what if a virus goes into my phone so maybe you buy apps to protect your phone but then you also want headphones because how can you enjoy a cell phone without headphones so that that is a never-ending cycle of wanting more by having more and so <laughs> the vanity of fortune but do is hadst thou entered the road of life with empty pockets oh how wondrous blessedness of perishable wealth whose acquisition robs thee of security so basically lady philosophy tells us that riches makes you more anxious it brings you more worry because the richer you are, the more anxious you are of the possibilities of losing riches or it being stolen from you. Like having those riches, you're more anxious of it vanishing or being taken away from you. Riches rob you of the feeling of security within yourself. So basically, riches don't make you independent. It makes you more dependent on the thing that guards it. Your mind will always be preoccupied and afraid because of this thing that you carry. So like, having too much wealth, having too much riches, that you have to rely on other things to guard it. Like... It makes you ask, is it even worth it? And now we move on to fortune. So as we have covered, Boethius has said his feelings on misfortune. So then basically, Lady Philosophy has an answer for him, which in my own words, in my own understanding is, Have you forgot that this is how the world works? When you were dining with bountiful food with your wife and two sons, you were grateful for fortune, but now that you're in jail, you curse her. So, like, like, she has a point i guess (laughs) so like see um lady philosophy is basically saying that that is how fortune works 
And in my own words, I believe what I got from this is that we are still blessed amidst the chaos. That's my own words. So like, if you quote it, it's me. <laughs> so, it is... Um, Lady Philosophy tells us that it's how it works. That is how fortune works. Because simply like Boethius, most of us are in the hands of true fortune in her wheel. Like, with fortune, with the wheel of fortune, you cannot always be up. But even if you're down, you can always look up. You get me? Like, even if you're sad, you can always look towards the blessed times. You can always be grateful. So, now, the, there's two types of fortune that Lady Philosophy tells us, which is the good fortune and the true fortune that through fortune that I have mentioned earlier but the good fortune is defined as when she wears the guise of happiness and most seems to caress is always lying and chains the minds of those who enjoy her favor by the semblance of delusive good Good fortune, by her allurements, draws men far from the true good. Ill fortune, oft times, draws men back to true good with grappling irons. So, let's go back to the definition of good fortune. With good fortune, you will never learn. True good, you will never learn because it always gives you the things that you want and it's always deceiving because if you're in that happy place you think that you'll be there forever and that is what the good fortune portrays it but then it hits you the reality that anything at any time can be tragic so the good fortune deceives you and it hurts you and it basically betrays you. Now, good fortune draws men far from true good because basically when you're in that happy state, you feel like you can do anything and anything because you will stay in that happy place and that is what good fortune tells you so then you do these things that make you happy vices and just anything that can make you happy even though it's far from what is virtuous it draws you far from the true good while true fortune ill fortune gives you strength it basically puts you in the state of adversity and it does not lie that you will be put there like it gives it is honest to you that some days are up some days are down but it gives you this um, sense of wisdom whenever you're down that it gives you strength and it gives you time to practice adversity because through adversity you will come out wiser and stronger and I think that it, this is a very good definition that ill fortune often draws men back to true good with grappling irons I think that's a good a very cool quotation that whenever someone goes through a tragedy they always come out stronger and is ready to face the next one if it ever comes 
So, when we further um, compare true fortune with good fortune, um, the simpler we can get to that is like, treat them as two different people. Someone you can be friends with. Um, so, true fortune... Um, I mean, good fortune is like a fake friend that would not really help you grow and be mature and is like just there for the good times and true fortune is a friend who will wake you up upon your delusions and will help you face the truth they're the types to tell you that um this boy ain't shit like you shouldn't be with him like they are those friends who can be honest with you even though if that honesty is a cold hard truth but they know true fortune knows that you can get through it that you're strong enough to face it now We'll proceed to book 5, which is the free will and God's foreknowledge. Now, as philosophy majors and as thinkers, we think about the question often, like, is there a God? And for Boethius, there is. And I believe that, like, most philosophers think there is and refer to it simply as the divine and now like on my personal take um, I mean like if you had prior experience with God how can you doubt his existence so um, now in the topic of God's foreknowledge we must First, define what knowledge is. Boethius defines it as free from all admixture of falsity. It is free from falsehood because of necessity, each thing must correspond exactly with the knowledge with grasp its nature. All that is known is grasped not conformably to its own efficacy but rather conformably to the faculty of the knower. Like, simply put, um, whatever is known is known according to the nature of the knower and not according to its own nature. Now, how do one grasp knowledge? How does the knower know? Now, there is four things first one is the senses of course we all know by touch and by feeling and now by imagination in this um, it is by prior sense and and impression and next one is thought which is a rational um, conception and superior to them all is intelligence because it cognizes the universal of thought the figure of imagination and the matter of sense without employing thought imagination or sense but surveying all things so to speak under the aspect of pure form by a single flash of intuition now understand God's foreknowledge I have outlined it into three things the first one is that God is eternal part two is his knowledge transcends, transcends all movement of time and abides in the simplicity of its immediate present the third is whatever happens is bound by necessity so, on the first one, 
all rational beings believe that God is eternal. Now, what is eternal in definition? It is that which comprehends and possesses the whole plenitude of endless life together, from which no future thing nor any past thing is absent. So, basically, God transcends through time. What is tomorrow to us is yesterday to Him. God is, as Plato says, God is eternal, but the world is perpetual. Means that God stays the same in the nature in eternity, while the world is ever-changing and everlasting. While the world changes, God perceives it, but his, He stays the same. Now, bearing that in mind, His knowledge transcends all movement of time and abides in the simplicity of its immediate present. The divine knowledge is providence because it resides above all inferior things and looks out on all things from their summit. Like, if, it, if you were to imagine God in a crowd, as funny as it is, um, he basically is not, um, he's basically not in front of you, beside you, I mean walking, in front of you, beside you, or like at your back, but he is above, he can see all things, like he protects the earth from above. And his knowledge is not comparable to the knowledge of humans because of the simplicity of his nature. Now, the third one is, whatever happens is bound by necessity. The same future event is necessary with the respect to God's knowledge of it but free and undetermined if considered in its own nature. Now, by the meaning of necessity is that something must happen. Like, there are two types of necessity. The simple necessity and the conditional necessity. Simple necessity is by which all men are mortals, for example. And the conditional necessity is if you know that someone is walking, he must necessarily be walking. So, in the examples of the sun rising, that is a simple necessity because the sun rises all the time and it is necessary that it does while conditional necessity in the example of um, a man being seated that it is known as a true fact only a true knowledge that it is necessary when in fact that man really is seated like it is conditional he must necessarily be seated for it to be true now if god foresees every action that we do is there still a point on deciding which ones to take so I can give you a few seconds to think about that. So basically this question is another question that derives to if there is actually free will, like if God 
already knows what I'm gonna do. Is there still a point of deciding of what I'm gonna do? So, um, to be honest, this concept of free will and God's foreknowledge took me quite a long while to understand. Because, like, how can my actions be free if God already knows what I'll do and what I'll do next and further? Um, I knew that it was a matter of necessity and it took me a while to find the answer, but the answer is this. It is not what is foreseen must necessarily come to pass but what is about to pass must necessarily be foreseen so to explain what basically is foreseen by god must not actually have to be so it means that we can always choose in which in which way we want to do things but this also means that everything we do God already know knew that we did it so like Boethius ask what if I did something that is not originally what God thought I would do so does that mean I'm betraying him and the lady philosophy answers the divine providence anticipates every future action and converts it to its own present knowledge in a single instant without being changed itself anticipates and grabs your changes like your actions are only necessary in the context of God oh scratch that that is wrong um so like this sex basically says that what i said earlier that god's intelligence is incomparable to that of human that he has this power to anticipate everything that you do our actions are only necessary in the context of God's intelligence in this um, s- said in this text things are necessary if viewed from the standpoint of the divine knowledge but if they are considered in themselves they are free of the bonds of necessity so actions are only necessary in the context of God's intelligence but within the actions just itself is not really forced to happen like a man walking god already knows that he is but the man doesn't necessarily have to walk he can stop anytime if he wants to and god already have anticipated that so it makes you think that even if you change your mind and even if it's not what originally is what is foreseen by God, God already have anticipated it. Like he already know every future and he just ties it up to a present of whichever you took of the future. <laughs> so Lady Philosophy indeed tells us that there is freedom, said she, nor indeed can any creature be rational unless he be endowed with free will. For that which hath the natural use of reason has the faculty of discriminative judgment, and of itself discri- distinguishes that what is to be shunned or desired. Now everyone seeks what he judges desirable. And avoids what he thinks should be shunned wherefore beings endowed with reason possess also the faculty of free choice and refusal so free will teaches 
us that our actions are still within our control and the outcomes of the result of our action even when one believes in karma because indeed God looks down from above distributing rewards to the good and the punishment of evil. And that reminds us to be aware of what we choose to do. And that is toward and that must be of good and towards the goal of being virtuous. So the consolation of philosophy of Boethius is indeed timely, especially in our time right now during this coronavirus pandemic. It teaches us that there is hope and our prayers and our relationship to God is never in vain. And that this is just through fortune showing her face amidst the challenges. And it teaches us that we must stay near truth and let go of the worries that is not even ours nor are in our control. And the Stoic sense what is in our control is just to stay at home, look out for each other, wash your hands, and it may not be as heroic as going to war, but it still pays the same. You can save lives with it. So say stay, stay safe, guys. Thank you for listening.